Earlier this week we were testing them out and it turned out to my chagrin that the installer was a Michigan State fan because he made them all green. And he made that one of the presets then later and I said no, no. So one of the presets now he calls it his uh, Easter egg and each one is a different color. And uh, so along the way we'll figure that out but uh, so you'll see they're a little bit of a different color and uh, there's still two more weeks of installation that he has to work on that. So uh, this is not the finished product yet. Tomorrow is a voters meeting. It is going to be at one o'clock in here in the sanctuary, but also online. Uh, in the two minute news that was sent out, there was instructions on how to sign up. Pre-registration is required if you plan to participate in the voters meeting through Zoom because we want it uh, to be able to do voting through Zoom, so we need to make sure that every participant on Zoom is a voting member of the congregation. And so that's why pre-registration is required. Uh, tomorrow, small group communion, because of the voters meeting being in here at one o'clock, small group communion will be offered between 12.15 and 12.45. That concludes our announcements, as exciting as they were. Uh, we now are going to continue our service with uh, invocation, calling upon God to be with us and seeking his forgiveness. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, we bring to you today our emptiness, that we have nothing to bring to you in our thoughts, our words, or deeds that is honorable and good, that deserves your praise. We come here just as we are, wrecked and broken by sin. We come here not presenting ourselves as glorious and grand, but we seek your glory. We seek your righteousness, knowing that we do not deserve it, but for the sake of Jesus Christ, we plead for mercy, we plead for forgiveness today, that you would receive us in your throne room not according to what our deeds deserve, but entirely by the gift of your love.
In the gracious promises of our Savior Jesus Christ, and as a called and ordained servant of Christ, I announce to you that your sin is forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our opening song today is Shout to the Lord. service now continues the reading of God's Word. Our first reading is from Jeremiah chapter 28, and here the, the challenge is that Hananiah and this kind of household of prophets that are in Jerusalem are trying to buoy people up with really good news. But Jeremiah knows that the truth might be a little bit harder than that, and he wants to make sure that people surround themselves not with just people tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear but that they're prepared to hear the truth, even when it's difficult. Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to Hananiah the prophet in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. 
May the Lord do so. May the Lord make the words that you have prophesied come true and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord and all the exiles. Yet hear now this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all of the people. The prophets who preceded you and me from ancient times prophesied war, famine, and pestilence against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, when the word of that prophet comes to pass, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading is from the seventh chapter of Romans, and here Paul is writing about kind of that, that tension between what can we expect from the law, what can we learn, what can we achieve, what can we accomplish, and what ultimately is something that the law can't do that God is going to provide in a different way. Do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. Thus a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve not under the old written code, but in the new life of the Spirit. What then shall we say, that the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced to me all kinds of covetousness. Apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seized in an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous, and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin, producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. The Holy Gospel is according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. Whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Now as an opportunity for a children's message, I am looking at Jeremiah chapter 8. And I am reminded in Jeremiah chapter 28 of traveling as a kid with my dad up to the cabin and asking, are we there yet? Now he could have said, yes, we're there. I suppose for a moment I would have felt good, 
But then when I realized we had another two and a half hours to go and we were not stopping for the bathroom anymore, suddenly the sadness of the truth was going to set in. My dad never did that to me, but my brothers did do that to me. When I would say, are we there yet? They would make sure to let me know, yeah, we're almost there. Start packing your stuff up. And then I'd realize we weren't there yet. I tell you that story about traveling in a car and being deceived by my brothers because there is a challenge in our days. There will be maybe some that want to just tell you that everything is good and easy and it will always be comfortable. And if something's uncomfortable and something's not easy, then it must be bad. But that's not the truth. Sometimes in this world, things will seem for a while uncomfortable, painful, and last much longer than they should. But on the other side of that is yet still promise and hope. Our God in this world doesn't make everything easy for us. This stay home and wearing masks and all of that, it's not really a spiritual thing, but it's a reminder that not everything in this world is easy. So when we are experiencing things that are not easy, that doesn't mean it's not of God. It means that maybe God through this time yet still can teach us that we must trust in him. We will trust in him even when it's not easy. We say prayers with me. Dear Jesus, teach me to trust in you, even when it is hard, because I trust in you to be my Savior. Amen. We continue with another song.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from the Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Our gospel lesson for today is a little bit of a surprise. It's a surprise because Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to bring peace. And then I think about Isaiah 9, 6, when we hear about the Prince of Peace, the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Or he, Luke chapter 2, when the angels announce that today in the city of David, a Savior has been born and he brings peace and good news upon all the earth. Or even John 14, 27, with Jesus saying, Peace I leave with you. It's a surprise to hear Jesus say, Do not think that I have came to bring peace on the earth. Because it's kind of surprising because there seems to be a lot of indication that he's the one that brings peace. He says, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. So there's a challenge here for me. It's kind of a surprise. Jesus is the, he's the Prince of Peace, no doubt about it. He is the one who brings peace and good news upon all the earth. He is the one that says, my peace I leave with you. I think a lot of that peace is going to be by faith right now. And it's going to be visible on the last day. When the trumpet blasts and the dead are raised and the mortal put on immortality and the perishable put on imperishability and that saying is written, Death, where is thy sting? Death, where is thy victory? Thanks be to God, our victory is in our Lord Jesus Christ. That peace, we'll see it then. But right now, Jesus has come to cut away, to separate us from our idolatry. That sword that he has brought into this world is the sword like a cleaver that is cutting the fat away from the meat. He is cutting out idolatry from us. Jesus comes and he cuts away that vanity that keeps us from thinking that we in our own structures of family, in the structures of our society, or just maybe ourselves, that we can deliver ourselves. We can bring ourselves into salvation, into utopia. We can bring ourselves to become our own refuge, our own security, and our own strength. And I wonder, why is it that we keep trying that? Because haven't we learned after a while that we make mistakes and we're kind of sinners and in society, some of the structures that we rely on and trust in society can also make mistakes and do things wrong. There are broken systems that exist. And there is a notion that if we just did a little more of something, a tweak here or a replacement of this or a little bit more money there, fill in the blank. Whatever you think that you can just add a little to. We can't bring ourselves to victory. I, I thought about if there's something wrong, can I just fix it in a little way? I remember first learning how to cook and I had one of those elementary school like teach yourself to cook with your parents kind of cookbooks. And so I had started to make cookies on my own and I had mixed the sugar and the salt. My mom come home, my mom comes home from work and I I said, Mom, the, the cookies, they, they didn't turn out right. Is there anything we can add to them to make them better? And she goes, no. There's nothing that you can just put a little bit of it on there and it will be all better. Maybe there's some recipes that you've messed up like that where you think there's no just adding a little bit to it and it will get better. But what if this ambition of self-correction is not something that we just sometimes deal with, but is the wrong direction we're always going in. Instead of getting closer to God, if I just try harder at this, or if I just tweak the governance of it this way, or if I just add, what if that ambition of trying and trying and trying, it doesn't get us closer to God, but in fact, it pushes us further away from God. That's what Romans chapter seven, our epistle lesson was about. It was about the law of God that when I thought I was alive and then I knew the law and then I found out the commandments and then I realized I was dead. So then I tried to keep the commandments more but then I found out I was even more dead. And so he talks about how the commandments have revealed our sin. It's not that the commandment itself was sin 
but that when I heard the commandment, my first thought was, yeah, that's wrong, but let me try better and I'll get better at it. And then the commandment itself becomes its own danger because I think if I just do it more and more and more, then I will be better. This is the tension that is in our gospel lesson. Jesus has come to bring peace, but that peace requires a sword to cut us away from the vanity of trying to save our own selves. This is going to reveal itself a little bit in this word freedom. One criticism of Christianity I've witnessed is that we're going to require of people a particular set of beliefs in order to be a member. When you join our Shepherd Lutheran Church, or when you are at the rite of confirmation, we'll ask you, do you believe? And it's not like you can just say, yeah, I don't believe, but I really like the architecture. You know, it's, it's kind of like belief is pretty central to our community, right? But having doctrines and having truths about God that we believe will hold us in common, for others that may look like a straitjacket, that we're preventing them from being and thinking and doing what they want. Reality is we are a community of believers and we are bound together by our shared faith in Jesus Christ. The opposition to this idea of being a community that's bound together by shared beliefs, what's the opposition to that? Well, it would be that someone saying, I want to be in a community where I am free to believe and do whatever I want and that everyone would respect my privacy and let me do whatever I want. That actually sounds nice to be able to be in a community where you can do and think and, and do whatever you want and no one gets in your way. That tension, though, is the reality of what the church is like in this world right now. As a church, we have a common set of beliefs and we are in a world where the demand is that we let people and we expect and we celebrate letting people be free to believe and do whatever they want. And the reality is that tension is just going to exist in the church. And we're not going to overcome that tension by demanding anything of anyone. That's not how we became a Christian. It's not someone demanded that we become a Christian. We became a Christian because the Holy Spirit was at work and the word that was preached, the word that was shared, and as the Holy Spirit was working, we believed. Our community that's held together by a shared set of beliefs didn't happen out of demand. It happened out of the Holy Spirit, working and turning our hearts to trust. But we can try to describe that to someone, that it's not that I have to believe, it's that I want to believe this. But there is going to be this, I don't know if you've heard it, this kind of tension between open and caring, narrow and oppressive. I'm not sure about you, but which side of those words do you want to be? Narrow, uh, let me see, I was over here with narrow and oppressive. Do you want to be narrow, narrow-minded and, and oppressive? Or do you want to be open and caring? I mean, that's kind of how the, the balance is between the society that we're in right now and the church. The society is you get to be whoever you want to be and think whoever you want to think and do whatever you want and open and caring. And the other side is the church demands things of you and they don't let you be and do what you want. I don't want to be narrow and oppressive. I want to be open and caring. So how do we resolve that? Do I just say, you know what, let's not worry about beliefs and let, let's not worry about doctrines and truths and let's just laissez-faire, do what you want. I think there's this foolishness, though, in this kind of freedom that says think and do whatever you want. And it is a confusion about what the word freedom is. It, it's this idea of the freedom to be and do whatever you want assumes that what you think and want is good. Where did that confidence come from? Because I've seen people think and do some things that are kind of foolish. There's actually a whole tradition of memes that talk about like how foolish people can be. Like I, I go to boardpanda.com and I can just see the stupidity of people in the world today. And I, I have a few moments in my own life where I'm really glad I don't have a ring doorbell camera that my kids could have recorded me falling down the porch or something like that and put that up there. 
The idea of the freedom to be and do whatever you want is built on this notion, notion of your superiority and your excellency and that there's no sin in this world and that you just got to try a little bit harder. Remember in the beginning of the sermon how I said the vanity that we have is that if I just try this or add this or put a little bit of it this, then I can finally find my salvation and I can be my own refuge, I can be my own security. That's called being your own God. The first commandment says, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no others. Freedom to be and do whatever I want only happens if sin is not in this world. Have, have you been traveling? Maybe a, you're the driver. So imagine the scene. You're, you're the driver. You're going somewhere, and you, you're pretty sure you know the general direction where it is. Now, the people in the back seat, they've got a different notion of where you're trying to go. And so they try to tell you that you're going the wrong way. But you see, you're the one driving. And they're in the back seat, so how can they know where you're going? And so what do you first think when they tell you that you're wrong? My opinion is usually I'm filled with a little indignation, a little arrogance, a little, you're wrong. I'm the one that, like, thought about this. I'm the one who got in the car. I'm the one that turned the ignition key. I know where I'm going. My first reaction almost every time is just, you, you don't know what you're talking about. That, that you have a narrow mind about how to get there. You're, you're oppressing me because you don't give me the freedom to drive where I want, I, to put it in the terms of what I was doing earlier. On the other hand, they're actually being open and caring because they don't want me to keep going the wrong direction, so they care about me, and they're open to the possibility that I might change and listen to them and correct my behavior and now turn and go a different direction. Christianity, when we tell people this is who God is, we're being open to the possibility that they'll believe in that truth. When we see someone going the wrong direction in their life and we invite them to see that Jesus is the way, the truth, and life, we are caring about them going the wrong way. And in the same way as brothers and sisters in Christ, when we provide that mutual encouragement, support, help, and correction to one another, we are open to the hope that the Holy Spirit will be at work in you and you will come to repentance. We care about you going the wrong way. We're not determining what a person must believe and practice in kind of a straitjack and constricting way, but this is now what I think about freedom. Freedom is not to be able to do whatever I want. I want to be free to be the one that God has created me to be. See, there's a difference between freedom of me becoming my own God. Guess what? You're not God, so that's not going to work out that well. Or how about freedom to be the one that God has made and created me to be? The freedom to become whom God has given me to be my meaning, my purpose. That's the kind of freedom that I believe Jesus Christ provides because he gives us the freedom from sin. We no longer are trying to become our own salvation. We're no longer trying to become our own rescue, our own strength, our own tower of salvation. We realize that's not happening, that we need from outside of ourselves a different solution. Jesus Christ comes into this world and he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's not being narrow and oppressive when he says that. He is incredibly open and caring in a world that's going to reject him and deny him and push him aside. And yet still he is saying, I will be your way. I will be your truth. I will be your life. Today, our society may look at this as a truth claim that's an infringement on liberty. Not word freedom. It's not a freedom to just be whatever. The liberty that we have is to become the greatness and grandness that God has for us when he said, let us make man in our image. Let us make a male and female. I want to assure you, with my own confidence and trust in what Christ has accomplished, I feel more free when I'm in Christ than when I'm apart from Christ. When I am in Christ Jesus, I am more free to become the one that God has designed me to be. 
I don't think this erases me. I don't think this makes me bland or monolithic. I don't become just some sort of robot determined to do whatever God demands upon me. Biblical promises about the kingdom of heaven are filled with promises of the uniqueness of people, nations, and languages preserving all the way through eternity. Isaiah 60 says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Darkness shall cover the earth, thick darkness the peoples, but the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will, see, will be seen upon you. And nations shall come upon your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. That promise in Isaiah is describing that on the day of the Lord, it's not like a bunch of people that all look and talk exactly the same arrive to give glory to God. He says the people of all the nations come, all the uniqueness, all the, the specialness of each person comes, and in the way that they have been created, they give praise to God. Or in Revelation chapters 21 and 22, St. John reveals this vision of the new heaven, the new earth, the city of God. And he describes the, the walls, he describes the river that flows through it, the street, and how there's no lamp or sun or moon or stars in the, in the city of God because the Lamb who sits upon the throne will be the light. And the thing that I really love about this, every time I, I read it, it just surprises me. He says, the gates of this city are never closed by day and there is no night there. And so that the nations are able to come and become a part of the city of God. Each culture, each nation, each people come. Christianity around the world is filled with all sorts of different beats and, and melodies and, and songs that fill the praises of worship. There is not a bland, everywhere it's all the same kind of worship. Christian worship in the world is more unique and varied and filled with the uniqueness of that culture than any other religion. You look at any other religion and their worship, it's the same as what their origin was. It's, the, it's supposed to become a mimicry of whatever that origin culture was. But in Christianity, if I showed you the, the Sephardic uh, rhythm of the Psalms or, or we worshipped in Aramaic or something like that, that wouldn't have anything for you, would it? We worship in the language and the time of us because Christianity gives us that freedom to be who we are in Christ as we give him glory and praise. Jesus has come with a sword to cut away family ties that become a higher priority than God. He has come when our own households, our societies, and our civil structures become a vanity exercise where we think this is going to be us and everything, that we're going to become this perfect nation or something. And then he says, and whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The final thing he cuts away, he cuts away mother, father, brothers, and sisters. He cuts away the household and then finally he cuts away self. The cross of Christ, it's a call for me to face persecution, struggle and opposition, but to love people anyways. The call to pick up the cross, the call for me to carry my own cross, it's a, a freedom to become a gentle suffering servant. It's the liberty to see everything that I am in the lens of being able to serve others. Because that's what the cross meant for Jesus. When he picks up the cross, he is entirely fulfilling the will of the Father. When we look at the first commandment, you shall have no other gods, and you compare it to some other kinds of liberty, people want to make themselves their own gods, and they'll use that word liberty to define themselves in kind of a, a sense of, I can be and do whatever I want, and you can't say anything against me. The Lord has said that he alone is God, and there should be no other. And so I want to give you this sense, a freedom that is a freedom to be and do whatever you want is a rejection of God's definition of meaning and purpose. A freedom to be and do whatever I want is a rejection of my relationship and care for my neighbor. Our society, I am nervous, is defining liberty without accountability to God and accountability to anyone else. As Christians, 
as we speak of our own desires to be what God has called us to be, they may see that as a straitjacket, limiting a, a boundary, a fence, and want to start singing, don't fence me in or something. But the truth, I think, is submitting to God and cutting ourselves away from sin, while it may appear dehumanizing, I trust that God's way, God's truth, and God's morals I think it's the possibility to become a better me and to be the one that God has called me to be. Friends, if we invite people to know this kind of God, it's not going to come through a demand. It's not going to be just that God is powerful and he gets to tell you what to be and what to do. And he gets angry if you don't do it. If we delivered people to that kind of God, that he's powerful and you better do what he says or else, yeah, I suppose that would be narrow and oppressive. But that's actually not the kind of God that I find in the Bible. It's not the kind of God that's revealed in Jesus. Jesus doesn't come and walk around and, and say, I'm the big cheese, you better do what I say. I don't know if he would have used that phrase anyways. He's not from Wisconsin. But, sorry, I think cheese heads and everything right there. All right, so what kind of God does Jesus invite us to? See, here's the thing. I think if you didn't have masks on, I'd see you smiling. I'd feel better about saying that joke. But because you all have masks, I think the joke just felt really flat. But in my mind, I think it went well. <laughs> we don't invite people to a God that says, I'm big, bad, and powerful, and you better do what I want. That is narrow. So what kind of God do we invite people to that gives us the freedom to be the ones that he calls us to be? We look to Jesus, the true revelation of God in this world, and he doesn't come to preserve and to protect his power. Jesus has come as flesh, and he's dwelt among us. He was crucified, he suffered, he died, and he was buried. Jesus served us. He became our sacrifice. By the love of God, us poor sinners, Christ was compelled to suffer for us as a servant on the cross. And when you realize what Jesus has done for you, you realize what you are inviting people to know is not a big, bad, powerful God that's trying to tell them what not to do. When you tell them about Jesus Christ, the one who loved and cared, suffered, died, was buried, and rose again, you're telling them about a freedom that you now have because a savior has served you, you now know how to serve others. Then you realize you're not afraid to give up your freedom to be whatever, because you've now find your freedom to be the servant for others that you've been called to be. I have this imagination that Christianity and the world will continue to be in some conflict for a while as we keep confusing one another's words about freedom. But I think that as we share our love with others, even if they will not love us in return, they'll start to realize what kind of God we're inviting them to. And they'll realize that that's a better freedom than the one that keeps going the wrong way. May this be the peace and the care of God which keeps and guards your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus this day and each day. Please now stand as we confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Are we, we're going to, there we go, all right. Maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, 
who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated as we have an offering of music and have a time to consider how our gifts may be an offering to the Lord. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, long just to bring something that's a word that will bless your Please stand. Now in our time of prayer, we have an opportunity to bring our requests, our intercessions, our thanksgivings, our supplications to the Lord. We draw near to the Lord's throne of grace. We pray as he has commanded us by trusting in the Lord Jesus to hear the prayers of his people and to answer our petitions according to his mercy. O most merciful God, Lord of heaven and earth, we pray you to so rule and govern your church and all her pastors and ministers that she would be preserved in the pure doctrine of your saving word, defended against all adversaries and protected in these days, that by faith we would be strengthened and our love would increase. Grant health and wisdom and integrity to all in authority over us, especially to Donald, President of our United States, Gretchen, the governor of this state, the Congress and all legislative bodies and all judges and magistrates. Provide them with your spirit and with respect for your word, that they would serve your good pleasures for the maintenance of, of righteousness and the punishment of wickedness, so that we would be led to a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. According to your gracious will, turn the hearts of our enemies and guide them to walk with us in humility and peace. Grant to those in trouble want, sickness, anguish of labor, peril of death, or any other adversity, the spirit of your grace, that they would find healing, strength, comfort, and relief according to your will. Hear us on behalf of this congregation as you, we ask you to bless and lead us during our voters meeting. Give us a thanksgiving in our hearts for those volunteers that have served and whose terms are finishing and be with those who are stepping forward to lead and serve in our congregation. We ask, Lord, that you would be with Andrew and Mackenzie Mills and their family as they prepare to move to Minnesota. Be with Heather Poynton's mother, Kathy, as she recovers from breaking her ankle. Ellen Woodfin as she recovers from knee surgery. The family of Nancy Brand as they grieve her death. And also the Al Wannafred's sister, Kathy, and family as they grieve the death of her son, Matt. We also grieve with the family of Gwen as she has passed away. 
We lift up all the names of the people that are upon our hearts and known by you. Give them courage that they would stand firm in their afflictions and find patience until the day of deliverance. Preserve us now, O Lord, from this present pestilence of the coronavirus. Give us courage in the face of every evil, every injustice. Give us also favorable weather, that the cause and the fruits of the earth would prosper, that we may enjoy them in due season and offer praise and thanksgiving for all of your goodness to us. Lend your blessing to all honorable vocations and honest industry that we would serve where our skills and abilities may be of good use. Give to all husbands and wives grace to live together in love and faithfulness. We especially celebrate with Janet and Mark McLaughlin who rejoice in 35 years of marriage. Bless the homes and families of your people. They may be places where your name is honored and love is nurtured. Give your special grace to the widowed the orphan, all mothers with child, the aged and the infirm, that we may grant them comfort, aid, and protection. All these things for which you would have us ask of you, we pray to grant to us for the sake of the bitter sufferings and death of Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we are bold to call you Father, and in whose name we pray, trusting in your mercy and confident that you will give answer to our prayers. And now lead us, O Lord, to pray as he has taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, after the supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Take, drink, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
Please stand. The body and the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Amen. Gracious God, you are our Heavenly Father, and you give us a foretaste of the feast to come in this holy supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming, we may, together with all of your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.